you assume the best of people, which is dumb. Yep. My well, fault. You're new at this. Don't worry about it. It's my first quarter century. From Challengers Comics and Conversation in Chicago, this is Contest of Challengers. And now, here are Dell and Patrick. Yeah, I wanted to do this one via Skype, even though, quite frankly, I enjoy the live together recording just because it's easier. It's more conversational. For all this techno setup nonsense. Nonsense, I say. But Yeah, I mean, I, I prefer the audio quality of doing it over Skype, but... I, I think of the the process of doing it just off of an iPhone sitting in a room together is probably a lot more conducive to a quality episode. Yeah, that plus, uh, I don't have a plus. I don't know why I started saying that. As soon as I started talking, I thought, I'm going to start moving some of this crap off my desk sure. and forgot what I was going to say. <clears throat> the benefit, of course, to doing it this way is that there's a lot of internet things I want to be looking up. Okay. As we're talking this time, so I have that option. But sure. first, I'm getting rid of all these goddamn cables. <laughs> there are so many, so many now. And I have to make sure I know why. I'm sure there's a setting, there's there's a dial and a button on the Samsung microphone that I just didn't bother to, you know, learn what they do. Sure. <clears throat> I'm a man, Dal. I don't read directions. I'm a man. I have uh, a beard. I, I'm from the, the plug-and-play generation. Sure. And I plugged, and it did not play. Yeah, because in the earlier days, everything just worked right away as soon as you plugged it in, right? Yeah. Right? right? Yep. Every single time. Never any problem. <clears throat> but now, I tell you. Now. Boy, when I was young and computers were new, oof, all that stuff. I wanted to record today specifically because today is, you know what today is, right? Thursday. And at least wanted to get the date out of you. Oh, sure. Uh, it's uh, your 25th anniversary as a comic book retailer. No, you're supposed to say August 27th. And then I was going to say, you know what happened? Uh, but yeah, you got it. Okay. Yeah, jump to the end. 25 years ago today, I started selling comics full time. I always mention full time because other people have started part time. No, nothing against starting part time. But <laughs> 25 years. No offense of, taken. Of, <laughs> I didn't necessarily mean you. Did you start part-time? I forget. Three hours a week? What? I what? forget. All right. Well, that's that's in a drawer. Let me just adjust the settings right here. Okay. I think we're good. How's that? Better now? Oops. Now it's talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we always need to start recording before we're actually... Uh, posted like the stuff that we're actually talking about because of the recording process sure we may lose stuff in the beginning so there's always good to have something to a buffer a buffer of nonsense if you will <laughs> will you i will i yes. do you are you are will we will do it how's your week been buddy uh so far so good it's a slower week yeah tail wise it's not a huge week or anything i felt like wednesday i wasn't really on very well i was making dumb mistakes and just wasn't clicking had a not a good wednesday i felt like you were not in the best of moods on wednesday uh there were a couple times where things frustrated me a little bit and something about the way that the reared are coming in early kind of throws me off a bit yeah because it it takes a lot out of me and usually that's the point where i kind of want to eat lunch because that would kind of bring me back into things sure but then you can't because it's one thirty. <laughs> uh, so that, Whereas that most there's... people listening to this will have ate, ate lunch, eaten lunch, yeah. like an hour before that. But you know yeah. our days are different, right? So yeah. Well, overall, do you prefer the reorder coming as early as it did this week or as late as it did last week? If I have to choose, I'd say early rather than late because there's a bunch of things that come in on the reorder that we need for the day. Yeah. But that said, I would always prefer it to come in like 1 o'clock. That helps me a lot more. When it because, used to come. Yeah, we get a little bit of a rush around like between 11.30 and 12.30. People coming in on their lunch breaks. And so I dislike having to unpack and check in and reorder then because that means that you have to stop what you're doing to ring people up. And I can't oh, really do much of anything because right. I'm 
I'm just focusing on the reorder. If it comes in at one o'clock, things lull a little bit. I have a little bit more time to work on it. And by the time I'm finished, it's lunchtime. And I, I get that. But specifically, me having to stop what I'm doing to ring people up. And honestly, as often as you and I are both embroiled in computer work and we're trying to get something done that needs to get done and we have to stop to ring somebody up and I'll get frustrated. But that's the number one reason we're there. Yeah, but the reason we have multiple people on Wednesdays is that we kind of have fallen into a pretty steady routine of you're going to work on invoice stuff for the first few hours, and I might work on Comixology. sometimes comicsology stuff later in the day. So there, we kind of switch off who's mostly ringing people up and who's mostly working on the computer. But, I mean, it, it should never – I should never be like, oh, I have to ring someone up. That's, that's the whole point of the store. No, the, the whole point is people getting help. And so yeah. if I'm if, if there's two of us, it usually doesn't take two of us to help one person. True. True that. And the other stuff needs to get done. Like doing the invoice allows you to then do the breakdowns, which allows you to do the new board, which allows you to do the email. So all that stuff goes in a sequence. Like if Yeah, there's definitely a pattern. There's definitely a routine. Yeah, if you if you don't finish breaking down the invoice until like three or four o'clock, it's doubtful the rest of that stuff is gonna get done by seven. But the only reason that's become a Wednesday task is because that's when the invoices become available. Yeah, plus you don't work Thursday. Yeah, but if they came available Thursday, I would do it on Thursdays. Sure. Over time, you you remember as well as I, things that keep changing in the industry, you know, release dates weren't always Wednesday. When yeah, I, I mean, I, I... They were Friday, then they were Thursday, then they were Wednesday and Monday, now Wednesday. Yeah, I remember there was a point... I mean, eight years ago, where regardless of new books coming on Wednesday, we didn't get invoices until Friday. Yeah. Like, that was it. Like, it would it would happen, like, late Thursday night. If there was a holiday, for some reason, they'd come Thursday morning, and we'd be like, oh, man, that's like, like so great. We get it a day early. Right. I remember some Thanksgiving Thursdays, I would, like, that night be able to work on invoices because they came early because it was a holiday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, stuff like that always always changes so it yeah. almost seems counterproductive that wednesday is spent working on next wednesday but yeah you know how many times though on a wednesday do we get a question of when is this coming out and the answer is next, next week. week yeah and the only reason we know that is because we're working on the invoice right but i mean there's other ways to look that up if we needed to to, to help people yeah but it's a faster answer if it's like i know the invoice backwards and forwards because i've just spent an hour working on it true that definitely so this is what it is now. I'm sure it'll change again. Sure. I don't know if you know this or not, Dal, but I've been doing this for 25 years now. So you don't say. I've seen a lot of things come and go, and a lot of changes happen. Yeah. And I'm sure I will see more. The only constant is change. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, something like that. So anyway, to touch on something we were talking about last week with the specific 5,000 and 4,999 copy variant covers that would cost <laughs> retailers 13000 to $16,000 or whatever. Both well, or uh, uh, Yeah, the, the Dark Knight yeah, one cost retailers uh, $20,000. Yeah. Maybe a little less. Maybe like eighteen if you have a really good discount. I, I think uh, I, it's around there. Yeah. So anyway, Oni Press has gotten into the game as it were <laughs> jesus uh in a very fun way uh-huh because they honestly they can't believe that a 5000 copy incentive is a thing sure so i'm going to read you a series of posts from james lucas jones from oni about this <laughs> okay starting with his shock over new previous catalog for november shipping comics arrived today DC is a 5,000 copy incentive variant. 5,000 copies. Comics retailers, if you order 5,000 copies of Exodus Number 1 by Josh Fialkov and Gabo, I will paint your house. <laughs> if you order 5,000 copies of Exodus Number 1, <laughs> Josh Fialkov, Gabo, and Charlie Chu will make you 100 pounds of wings. They mention a, a, a name, Pac Pac. Pock Pock Wings. Okay. Comics retailers, if you order 5,000 copies of Exodus number one, by the way, we keep saying Exodus number one, but it's the... The Life After Volume 2. The, this, yeah, that's exactly right. Life After Volume 2. Yeah. 
If you order 5,000 copies of Exodus number one, uh, Josh Fialkov, Gabo, and Shy from Oni will plan your staff holiday party. If you order 5,000 copies of Exodus number one, Josh Fialkov, Gabo, and Ari Yarwood will read the new Franzen and pretend to like it. The new what? Uh, Franzen. I don't know what that is either. Oh, Jonathan Franzen? Sure. Okay. Some of these I don't, because I'm reading them for the first time. Sure. Uh, Josh Fialkov, Gabo, and Janos will reorganize your vinyl and or MP3 collection. Josh Fialkov and Gabo and Isle of the Damned will teach you to hook up an NES to an HD TV. So uh, is it all of these you get or just one? That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, if, it's, if it's all of them, let's do the math. Hold on. There's two more. Okay. Order 5,000 copies of Exodus number one, and Gabo will draw your shop into number four. Be the first comic book store in Purgatory. <laughs> Order 5,000 copies of Exodus number one, and I, James Lucas Jones, will get your store's logo as a tattoo. Oh, man. And then he found that the 5,000 copy incentive cover has a $6 cover price, and he posted a great Dylan Horrocks illustration. Of Jack Kirby looking at you saying, kid, comics will break your heart. <laughs> so what is the cover price on Exodus number one? I'm going to say three fifty three. You know what? I'll look it up. I'm, I'm going to assume it's three ninety nine. I'm not entirely positive. Yeah, I, I don't I don't remember what most Oni stuff retails for. But if it's three nine, if it's uh, oh, yeah, if it's three ninety nine, it's the cheapest of all of these. Oh, by far. Yeah. Well, by by a dollar. No, I mean, what's Deadpool number one? Is that five bucks or six bucks? Four ninety nine. So five bucks. Okay. I guess I mean by far in the sense of when you times that one dollar by five thousand, it's five thousand dollars cheaper. <laughs> oh sure. Exodus Life After Number One is a three ninety nine cover price. Okay, so ten thousand dollars. Yeah. Well, hold on. Let's let's. Uh, I can't I can't pull my calculator up because of Windows ten. Thanks Windows ten. But I'm gonna just try to see what it would be. For a store such as us, although yeah. you probably already have that. Uh, I I How assume our our only discount is fifty. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Five thousand dollars. Yeah. Five thousand dollars. Huh. So for five thousand dollars, if you, I I imagine although if you pick one, I, I guess technically it would be forty nine hundred dollars probably. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Because of the one cent. Sure. Uh, I'm going to ask him and see if he responds over the course of our recording. Ask who what. James Lucas Jones, that question. Oh, if, if it's everything? Yeah. Because, I mean... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's, yeah, I mean, two, like it's $10,000. Is it worth $10,000 to get James Lucas Jones to get a Challenger's tattoo on his body somewhere? So is it worth, is it worth $10,000? <laughs> I don't have any vinyl for them to organize. And my MP3s are in pretty good shape. Thank you. Uh, my, but my MP3s could all use, like, new cataloging and stuff. It's true. I feel like you should try to stall while I'm typing. Oh, um, I, yeah, I, I like Life After, and I, I was already thinking, like, how, what are ways that we could do real deep discounting to kind of recoup costs on this, you know? Like, what if we sold Life After for a buck, you know? Yeah. I don't know that we could move 4,000 copies that way. <laughs> okay, we'll see if he gets this. I okay. think he's currently active, so we'll, we'll see if this goes. Okay. That'd be great, though. <laughs> But yeah, like half those things don't actually matter to no, me. No, of course not. I mean, they're jokes. Like they're not they're not legitimate benefits to anybody. They are like painting your house is the thing that's the most like maybe if I needed my house painted, not that I would want James Lucas Jones to paint my house. Yeah, he also acknowledges he's not a professional house painter, but yeah. No. And we'd probably still have to supply the paint. So yeah. It's... Would he fly out here on his own dime? He would have to. And as I think the mo the thing, no surprise to anyone, that I'm most most interested in would be the hundred pounds of wings. Sure. But I don't know that they would survive the trip from Portland. Yeah, they're not going to come to Chicago and make them for you. They're they're going to ship them out. So, yeah, and and I mean, obviously, five thousand copies. Is getting worse. Five thousand copies of Exodus number one would be more than doubling the actual print run of Exodus number one. Huh. I don't know. Maybe. I wonder if we could get a Challengers logo on all of them. Not our incentive, just all of the copies. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, no joke. If, if you're, 
if you're adding that many copies to their print run like i don't know what 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 the sales of something like life after were previously but i can't imagine they're over three or four thousand copies yeah i don't know uh it's an interesting question i don't know i i would really be surprised and that's no slight to the guys that do it that's just the, the position of that book in the marketplace that's just the economics of comics yeah i mean that's 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 just sales data i'm not having a value judgment i'm just saying i don't think they would sell more than three or four thousand copies of that book normally so five thousand copies obviously would be you know a huge change for that title and i also feel that any holiday party that challengers would have probably is a little bit smaller than the kind of things that shy is used to well I mean, let me tell you this. If we spent $10,000 on Exodus number one, we would have a very small, uh, poorly catered holiday party. Yeah, we wouldn't have any money for a holiday no, party. No. Although it's very much in character for Challengers if we had $10,000 to blow it on a stupid gag like making James James Lucas Jones get, get a, a tattoo. tattoo. Yeah. Like now, not on new fixtures, new carpeting, new computer, like paying bills. Nope. We're going to spend it on like some goofy joke thing that they put on twitter never meeting anyone to take them up on it yep yep that sounds like us that that absolutely sounds like us 25 years in the business and i don't know any better than that no because it sounds like it would be fun see and comics are fun or they're supposed to be fun sure tim seeley posted a link to a website called comic book roundup have you been there before no It basically breaks down books by publisher and ranks them as to the best reviews. And I assume the reviews are from this site. I don't know if it's, I I assume it isn't links from around the web. And I I don't think that. Oh, it's like Metacritic. uh, uh, Okay. I don't know what that is, but I'm assuming it's the exact same thing. Uh, Metacritic is a thing for a variety of media where it, it accumulates and aggregates a lot of different reviews and gives them a, a sum total based on, you know, if, if 20 different people review something at, you know, four stars and 20 people review something at three stars, the Metacritic rating would then be three and a half stars based on 40 reviews. You mean like a Rotten Tomatoes thing, but across um, comic review platforms? Yeah, well, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be comics it would be i i think i've mostly seen it for video games but i don't know if they've branched out to other things uh, uh metacritic it, carries so much prominence that a lot of studios and uh people who work on video games have royalty structures built in where the game has to rate over a certain amount on metacritic wow like if, if it doesn't hit like an 80 or whatever on metacritic out of 100 no one gets any royalties regardless of how it sells holy cow yeah that's serious so yeah, it looks like looking at these, yeah, it's it's straight up, uh, it's Metacritic, but for comics. Did you go to it? Yeah, I'm looking at it. Um, what I wanted to bring up, because this, there's been a lot of discussion in the industry the last couple days about DC Comics. Sure. You know them as the company that keeps losing market share in our store. <laughs> yes. And the articles that I've seen recently, and uh, Heidi McDonald on the beat had a I guess the best spin is that DC is going to be changing the way they're doing things because what they were calling the new look DC, which is NU as in new metal. At least that's how I liken it. Uh, The DCU stuff is uh, an immediate failure and they're going to be going back to the old ways. And uh, it looks like, None of the new ideas were Dan DiDio's, but all the old ideas were, and he's excited to be able to do his way of of thinking again and even gets to say to people like, well, you know, we tried, it didn't work, and that they've put a hold on uh, Batgirling titles. Uh Did you read any of this stuff? No, is this on the beat? Yeah, it was in the beat uh, yesterday, the day before. Okay, Uh, usually the way I'll read stuff on the beat is getting uh, stuff in my... Uh, feedly news feed okay uh but for whatever reason their rss feed updates like once a week <laughs> oh weird so i yeah if there's anything from this week i don't think i've gotten anything from them wow uh, well so I'm, I'm looking at the beat now i'm gonna try and find it what i find most interesting while looking at this list and i'm gonna go over this list very briefly 
the number one reviewed DC comic is Justice League, and it has a score of 8.6. Number two is Grayson, also with an 8.6. Uh-huh. Number three is Prez, also with an 8.6. Now, the way they're ranked 1, 2, and 3 with the same percentage is based on the number of reviews. Number four is Gotham Academy, 8.5. Batman clocks in at number five at 8.3. Black Canary is also 8.3 at number six. Midnighter is number seven at 8.2. Omega Men is 8.1 with number eight. Batgirl herself is 8.1 at number nine. And Harley Quinn is also an 8.1 at number 10. So of those top 10 books, you have books like Omega Men, Midnighter, Black Canary, and Prez, which were all new launches. Right. And then you have Gotham Academy and Batgirl, which are books that definitely take a whole different tone. And even Harley Quinn, which is one of their better sellers, is a little bit outside of the main DCU, as it were. Sure, but reviews don't matter, and that's kind of the whole point, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, the books that everyone, everyone, in quotes said they wanted was more titles like Batgirl, more titles like Gotham Academy. And so the DCU stuff was more titles like those. And guess what? Nobody bought them or not enough people bought them. And now the people who bought them may go online and review them and talk about how great they are and try and evangelize for them. But not enough people are buying them to keep making them. And certainly not at a line-wide DC Comics level. You know, Batgirl may do well, but five Batgirls are probably not going to do as well as Batgirl. They're going to each do fractions of that number. Sure. And even Batgirl isn't the number one title DC publishes. That's Batman. And further down the list, you're looking at high sales on stuff like Justice League and more Batman. And those are the books that changed beyond, you know, new characters, maybe. The direction of them, the tone of them didn't change at all. Justice League is more Justice League than it's ever been. Jason Fabok draws it. <laughs> Man, you love Jason Fabok. I don't. Um, so, yeah, I, as much as I really enjoyed some of the new launches, I think Prez is terrific. I think Omega Men is really, really good. We pushed those books and maybe sold a bunch of issue ones, but we didn't sell a lot of issue twos. People didn't buy them. Nope. So, I, you know, we're not going to order high and we're not going to push them because we did and no one wanted to follow up. So why would I keep pushing those titles? It's wasted effort. It's the same kind of trickle down that, Image has sales wise only at a much accelerated, much more accelerated pace. Yeah. Whereas it takes people three to four to five issues to fall off of new image series. Right. They're falling off of these DC books immediately. I, I guess they're just not clicking people. with people. I mean, you can say that, that, you know, quality is subjective and, and maybe that's what it is. You know, what's a great book to me is not a great book to everybody. But there's something about DC that's really weird where it just feels like both institutionally at DC Comics under Jim Lee and Dan DiDio, but also from a fan level, there's this constant pressure to kind of just make DC Comics, and DC Comics in a really specific Justice League, Batman, Jeff Johns, Scott Snyder way. And as much as the quality is way better now, in the sense that there's more, at least for me, there's more books I want to read from DC than there were a year ago, the sales seem to reflect that people want, you know, Batman and Justice League, and they want it in a very specific way. Yep. There should be tons of diversity in, in comics, and there should be tons of diversity in superhero comics. But there's just something about DC comics where they don't want to make those books, and no one wants to buy them from them. So I can't imagine why they would keep pushing that. Like, I guess people are just going to have to get those books from Marvel the way they've been the last few years. Speaking of Marvel, we were able to get the November All New All Different checklist out much earlier this year, this this month because mm-hmm. we were planning on doing things differently last month. It didn't work that way. And we started to get them um, back in already starting this Wednesday. I didn't look any of them over yet, and I'm curious if you mm-hmm. had and if you oh. could see what a – did you say no? I didn't. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, they were just putting them in piles because it was Wednesday and I really didn't have a chance to, to do anything with them. So looking sure. at them would be not a good use of time. Um, mostly what I saw people doing um, was, you know, a real quick, this one, this one, I want these franchises sort of stuff. Yeah. People seem to be signing up for the books they were already getting. Uh, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't see many people taking chances on some of the new books. 
Yeah. Um, the thing that I think this, and to a lesser extent, the previous checklist had was that people had already spent a bunch of time with the promotion for all new, all different Marvel, like the magazine or online stuff. Yeah. So they had a pretty good idea of what they were already interested in. And they were just looking for those titles on the list. When they found them, they checked them. So it wasn't a lot of like, let me read all these synopses and find out which one appeals to me. They'd already decided for the most part, based on the creators, the images, that sort of thing. Since Marvel announced they're going to be putting out another all new, all different preview book. Mm -hmm. And it's, free based off of your discount level so we're getting the same amount we always get yeah about 125 do we think that that is a return to their old previews or more like the one they already gave us because that that other on the oh, no no it's it's going to be like the one they did um for the first couple months of secret wars okay that's what i thought you know here are four or five interior pages from like six different books because if we had known the other one, we would have actually paid to get more, which you can do sure. at the cost of 20 cents a copy. Yeah. So this one, not going to be worth it. Yeah, I mean, we'll do what we usually do for those, which is they're going to go out on the counter on Wednesday, and we'll try and make sure that anyone who gets Marvel Comics gets a copy of those. But, you know, if they last a couple weeks, that's fine. Because all of that stuff is going to be for books that are shipping that month anyway. So by the second or third week, you can just buy those comics. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need a preview of it. Yep. Just go, just go buy them. I don't know. I, I just wish that they had a better handle on the promotional tools they're giving us because they still give us all sorts of things we never use. Or yeah. when they give us a, a stack of postcards for the Secret Wars, Secret Love book, mm -hmm. they give us more postcards than copies of the book. Obviously, they want to get people excited, but yeah, the book came out and we still have a stack of postcards because people don't really care enough for postcards. No, no, they don't. Uh, that being said, this week we're getting a coloring giveaway poster that okay. we will keep all of those for sidekicks. Okay, cool. Our coloring books are getting pretty beaten up, and even the new one, the Captain America Black Widow one Jimmy got for us, mm -hmm. is is pretty well picked through. Sure. Also, a lot of them disappear, and I've noticed a lot of a lot of adults when a child colors on a page, they tear it out and take it. They don't ask. No, they just take it. They just tear it out and take it. Now, I don't know what I was expecting, but there's a whole other side that could be used. Yeah. And and this is not... I never thought this was garnering savable works of art. This was just something for a kid that doesn't want to look at comics and is bored can do. Yeah. I guess I had different expectations for that aspect of sidekicks. Sorry. Something else that I didn't expect for sidekicks, which I should because this is retail and the general public comes in the store on a regular basis and a lot of people in the world are terrible people, is I'm still surprised by the number of things that get stolen. Sure. This week alone, we lost a reverse flash ring yep. because it was a very small package, but it was literally on the shelf for like a half an hour before it got lifted. <laughs> yes. The drawback was I was alone in the store at the time and I was pretty sure what was happening, but I got called away to help somebody. Mm -hmm. And that's when the thieves, plural, because I know who it was, made their move. And there was literally nothing I could do to, to prevent it. Yeah. And that, of course, happened um, a few weeks ago as well with somebody who brazenly took a larger action figure. But... The, the moral is we, we just we can't carry small things. No, or we can't. I mean, we, we're not one of those stores with like giant glass counters at the front of the store where all the high ticket merchandise Knicks, goes. Yeah. So, we, yeah, I, I don't. And we just started getting more like TV show replica prop stuff in because it's neat. Like we, we sold a, a Gotham badge, you know, a yeah. Gotham City detective badge. And, like, literally sold that. That's the thing that came in. Somebody, like, yeah. bought it. Well, so if if half of that stuff is going to get stolen, I'm fine not carrying it at all. Absolutely. It's just sad. Yeah. I mean, that's... There's so many things over the years where it's like, this is why we can't have nice things. And this is just one more. Yep. And every time we think, do we institute a bag policy? Do we have to start checking people's bags before they go in there? Mm. Well, that thing was so small, it fits in a pocket. Yeah. So after you know we learned from our mistakes mm -hmm. the second one we have is packaged in a different way where it's 
considerably bigger and harder to just pocket. Hopefully. Yeah, which I should have done for the first time, but I didn't think about it because I didn't think I had to. You assume the best of people, which is dumb. Yep. My well, fault. You're new at this. Don't worry about it. It's my first quarter century. I'm just going to go through the tabs that I have open. Okay. Last weekend was SummerSlam in the wrestling industry. Well, everywhere, Patrick. It was SummerSlam in the whole world. Whole world. And as we've been talking about, Stephen Amell, the Arrow, the Hood, the Vigilante. The Green Arrow. The Green Arrow wrestled. He and Neville teamed up against Stardust and the Cosmic King, Wade Barrett. <laughs> and Neville and uh, Arrow won. And I... I alternate between calling him Stephen Amell and Arrow because that's what Stardust does. Yeah, Stardust. You, plus, you chided me so many times when I would say Stephen Amell and you'd say, I'm sorry, who? And you'd keep doing that until yes. I said, the Arrow. Correct. <laughs> yes. Because that is what Stardust would want. And yet I let it go. So they, they wrestled and Stephen Amell's team won. Well, normally in the wrestling industry... They build to matches with a lot of, uh, nowadays especially, social media interaction. Mm -hmm. And just because that match is over doesn't mean the feud is over, per se. Here's a Twitter exchange between Stephen Amell and Stardust. Stephen Amell says, Working on my ring wind. I don't know what ring wind is. Maybe he meant endurance. Maybe he'd mistyped work. I don't know. Working on my ring wind. You know, just in case somebody can't come to grips with the fact they lost. Stardust, in character, says, I have a statement regarding the boy. <laughs> Heed my words. It is one thing getting lucky in having a formidable yet toady partner. It is another monster entirely being alone in the ring with the prince. With me. Stephen Amell says, blah, blah, blah. The fact remains, you back... <laughs> You backed away from our only two encounters like a child hiding like a child hiding pea-soaked bedsheets. Stardust replies, The boy wouldn't last ten minutes, so I encourage Oliver's passionate fan base to no longer encourage this madness. I would hurt him. <laughs> and that's where it is for right now, but that's just that's fun. Sure. We I did we we talked about Stardust's in-character comic interview on Comic Resources or wherever it was? Uh, we might have. I don't remember. It was, I, I know that we read it and both enjoyed yeah, it. I don't know that we talked about it on the podcast, but yeah, it was right before SummerSlam, uh, Comic Book Resources did an interview with Stardust, and he replied totally in character, and it's fantastic. Like uh, He's eloquent and in character and hilarious and A crazy. comic fan. Don't forget that. I mean, that's one of the reasons that I am comfortable talking about this on a comic shop podcast, because it's comic related at its core. Sure. Yeah. He's a fan. He's got a polls list like yeah. the kids these days. Like as the kids say, he has a polls list at a local comic shop. Yes. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. And uh, it was it was really entertaining, both as a elapsed wrestling fan and also as a comics fan, because his references are very. And an specific. Arrow fan now. Don't forget that. I'm sorry. And an Arrow fan. Okay, sure. <laughs> uh, occasionally, yes. Um, but his references uh, were not just the standard, like, Marvel movies and, you know, whatever's popular. Like, it was, like, Granny Goodness gets name-checked a couple times. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, pretty cool stuff. Modeled an outfit after Mr. Sinister. Uh, yeah, he's, he's a real, genuine comics fan. And... Yeah, the Arrow stuff has been pretty entertaining. I hope there's more. I assume but, there will be. I mean, short of him getting hurt on a TV show or a wrestling show, I think there will be. Either either way, that could work. <laughs> I mean, getting hurt, that, that could happen either way. Sure, absolutely. It's it's actually, I'm kind of surprised they're letting, uh, the CW is letting him do as much of this in-ring stuff. While it's good promotion, you're doubling the chance of him getting hurt and that could really negatively impact the tv show that probably costs a lot more money than an average episode of raw does yeah yeah that's true um moving along but still keeping in the same website that i'm pulling this from which is of course 411 mania <laughs> okay <laughs> um a little bit of hollywood stuff here 
Um, but I'm bringing it up because there's, I think, a, a big omission. Forgive me for saying his name wrong. Mads Mikkelsen? Sure. Hannibal? Yes. TV's Hannibal is in talks to play an as-yet-unknown villain for Doctor Strange. Okay? Uh-huh. He was apparently supposed to have been... He was Malekith at he, one point. Yes, he was Malekith. And he couldn't get out of his, his TV stuff, so it was Chris Eccleston. The best part is, in this article, they say, While the villain has not been named, there are some possibilities. Chiwetel Iufor is playing Baron Moro, so that role is out. But other possibilities include Mephisto, no. or more likely... Dormammu. Of course it's Dormammu. Like, who else would it possibly wait, be? Wait, wait, hold on. Hold on. Other possibilities include Blackheart. No. Yandroth. <laughs> no. And Xandu. No. They, they describe who each of these characters are, but we don't need to do that. This is a comic podcast. Yes. No, it's Dormammu. No, man, no. So, the picture that they show... I looked at it, and it's just him and, like, like I think it's a Hannibal promo piece, actually. Probably. I looked at it and said, holy shit, that's Nightmare. Interesting. And also, you don't, like, you mentioned Blackheart, Yandroth, and Xandu before Nightmare? Yeah, if you're naming Doctor Strange villains, it's Baron Mordo, it's Dormammu, I get that. Nightmare is number three. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I just feel like Dormammu is more... I'm trying to think of a good way to say this. It's more classic yeah. Doctor Strange origin material. If you're if you're going no, to no, I was going to say like, and this is the 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 worst word to use for Dormammu in a Doctor Strange context. It's more relatable. Okay, like, like Nightmare is a weird character because you kind of like personifying something like that makes it really strange. That's why Mephisto, because he's the devil, is maybe not as likely. But Dormammu, he's a demon, you know? Yeah. Like, it's for a, a special effects-heavy supernatural film, he's pretty straightforward and easy to convey, you know? Sure. Like, Nightmare, Mephisto, Blackheart, you, there's a lot of... You're kind of sticking your neck out on some of that stuff. But Dormammu is a constant effects shot. Probably. I mean, there's ways you could do it. And, I mean, Jesus Christ, they did Ultron. You know? Yeah, but Ultron, Ultron's a real thing. They they did Groot and Rocket. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like they've done plenty of FX only characters that are on screen probably way more than Dormammu would be. True. Yeah, I I don't see why it wouldn't be Dormammu other than the fact of like maybe they want him visible more. So I mean, maybe that's what makes me think maybe Nightmare because at least that way you're seeing his face. Yeah. In a way that you necessarily wouldn't with and Dormammu. My my point isn't. I think that. Mads Mikkelsen is going to be Nightmare. It's why would you leave Nightmare out of this article? Yeah, it, it seems like a kind of glaring omission, especially considering that some of the people you're naming are deep cuts who will in no way be in this film. Or probably any film. Yeah, I tricky. I, I feel like Dormammu is more of like I, I feel like he's gonna be like a Thanos for the Doctor Strange, you know? Like he'll be in this one some, but in the next one more. Sure. No, I get that. That's fine. That's totally fine. Yeah, but it's neat to see Mads Mikkelsen in a bunch of stuff. Like, I hadn't realized how in demand he was until Hannibal ended officially and everyone got released from their contract and suddenly it's like, he's in a Star Wars film. He's in Doctor Strange. Like, Jesus Christ. Like, busy dude. Yep. Especially because Rogue One is shooting now. And then, like, as soon as that finishes, he would go do Doctor Strange. So it's, it seems like a lot of time in Disney franchise films for one guy. Did we talk about, and this is terrible that I can never remember and you can never remember, and I'm sure people listening hopefully it's been 25 can. years, Patrick. Cut yourself some slack. <laughs> did we talk about local comic shop day? Um, I don't think we did. Because okay. it's, it's only just recently started to solidify. Actually get mainstream press kind of thing. Right. Well, because they yeah. know now who's involved and what they're going to do with it. Right. Do you want to go into a little bit more of detail for it? Oh, oh, it's all yours. It's set for what they call Small Business Saturday, which is the Saturday after Thanksgiving, the Saturday after Black Friday. Mm -hmm. And it is based off of Record Store Day, which is a day that the record industry has a lot of vinyl exclusives meant to be 
a, a thing that draws people into record stores to spend money. Yeah, it's kind of the opposite of Free Comic Book Day, where Free Comic Book Day is, we're going to give you free stuff. Maybe we're going to have sales or something. Maybe we're going to have artists and writers. Maybe we're going to have cosplay. But come to the store and we'll, we'll make it a fun free event for you. Um, record Store Day is there will be a lot of limited things you can come and buy if you get in line early enough. And maybe you'll be able to keep those, but you'll probably just flip them online like everybody else does. And that's the thing that is the most, uh, not troubling to us, but long story short, you have to opt in. There's a fee to opt in, which is a minimal fee. It's fine, but then you'll have to buy the product as well. And as of now, like 163 comic stores have agreed to do this, but it's only been open enrollment for a short time mm -hmm. and what doesn't work for us is that these are limited exclusive variants for the most part we don't know for sure what the merchandise is going to be yeah only one publisher who's participating has announced what they're going to do and it's just variant covers to some comics and we're okay if things have a suggested retail price on them yeah like if, it's, if, they if say, it's a limited edition comic that we're selling for four dollars because we're being charged two dollars for it okay sure you know if it has a price tag which i'm sure most retailers would not want to have no no because they're going to be marking it up yeah whatever they think they get or it's just going to go online mm -hmm. that's exactly right and it's going to be i'm sure just like record store day it's going to be limited quantities and stores won't get everything they ask for and things like that yeah they comics pro who's who's coordinating it had told us from the start that quantities will be limited and numbers will be allocated. So by design, you're going to be getting a very small fraction of what you might think you can sell because they want to make sure that this is, you know, a limited edition item that people are going to be excited to get. You said the phrase or the, the two words that or actually I guess one word, depending on how you look at it, that what interests me most in this next line of conversation about local comic shop day. Mm -hmm. It's a comics pro event. Yes. Comics Pro, the retail organization that we're a part of, is the one putting this together, getting the publishers on board, and making it a thing. They're the one doing all the work for this. Okay? Another retailer claims it was his idea. <laughs> okay. And I'm... This is uh, this is from his Facebook. I'm just going to read it because it's, it's public. And, you know, if, if it wasn't a public thing that everyone had access to, I don't know how he'd feel about putting it out there, but... It's there. It's there if you find it, so I'm just bringing it to you. Just found out about this local comic shop day. Love the idea. You know, when I came up with it four years ago at C2E2 Retailer Summit on the exact same weekend they are proposing it should be. Also loved it better when I suggested it be free. Hate that this is a Comics Pro event. Really hate that they basically stole the idea I spelled out to them last year while they were shilling that crappy Halloween comic fest for Diamond, and absolutely despise that six publishers in this industry have signed on to a plan that charges $10 for Comics Pro members under the guise that it's to confirm that you are a brick-and-mortar shop, and $50 for all the stores wise enough not to be given, not, not to give $300 to Comics Pro a year for it to get squandered, pampering the board, embezzled, giving aid and comfort to Comixology, the enemy of all comic shops, and generally promoting a cachet of retailers as the elite ruling class of independent comics retailers. Oh my god. To make a long story short, I'm really pissed you have corrupted my idea on the date I suggested and are trying to con retailers not in your club to pay you 400% more to participate in something that every comic shop should be able to join for free. Make it free and I'll confirm every shop that wants to participate for free. Discuss it with retailers before pushing forward with so etching, with so etching that, ref wait, I'm having a hard time with this. End. Discuss it with retailers before pushing forward with so etching that reflects on all of us. And I hope Ski, David, Gabriel, Mike, and the other publishers know you planning on charging rank-and-file retailers more to play in this reindeer game. Uh, I assume so etching is a typo for something. Okay, I, I assume. Um, yeah, I, I never minded the fee because I assume it's largely administrative fees and costs. Um, sure. someone, someone has to coordinate a lot of these things. Someone has to get all these stores... Uh, listed on the website, which you can already go to to find out who's participating in local comic shop day. 
it's more for non-Comics Pro people because this is a Comics Pro-led event. And if they have to include a lot of other stores who are not normally participating in Comics Pro, which they think has value, it's going to cost a little bit more. I, if you want to call it a penalty, call it a penalty. Join Comics Pro. Participate in the process. Well, Larry, of course, uh -huh. from Larry's Comics... Not a surprise. ...says... $50 to participate and not have to join Comics Pro? Bargain of the century. Yeah. Heck, I'll plunk down another 50 if I don't have to interact with them. Uh, so who was, the, uh, who was the person who did the first post? The person that did the first post is somebody who was a Comics Pro member, and honestly, I thought was still a Comics Pro member, but I don't pay attention to who is and who isn't. Yeah, the drama. And he even said that he spelled out the idea to them last year, 2014. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming he was a member still back then. Uh, he is also someone who, on <laughs> one of my anniversary posts on Facebook today, I have a post that is making the rounds between Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram that says, people, learn who you are. Embrace it own it put it out there and if others don't get you fuck them he commented and said that's good advice i should try that sometime and i feel like he already does that <laughs> uh but it's weird that just i i don't know if i want to name him because of that well i mean it's a public post right I mean, yeah that's true him. dennis barger okay wonder world that guy yeah yeah um i somebody had uh, a really good pun i'm gonna see if i can find it I, I can't speak to the veracity of his claims. I mean, that's this is largely a he said, she said sort of thing. Right. And it, I hope it's not true, um, but I'll offer the possibility that it is. And if it is, it's a shitty thing they did. Um, I don't mind the fees involved, as we just talked about. And I think he loses a little bit of credibility by stretching his argument out to both claim that they're going to embezzle all this money and use it to pay for their own entertainment, which is an insane thing. Um, but then also... To then throw Comixology under the bus when they have literally nothing to do with this. And I don't feel in any way Comixology is the enemy of all retailers. No, but there's a lot of people in Comics Pro that did feel that way. That left the organization when it seemed like Comics Pro was kowtowing to Comixology. And not fighting digital comics enough. So yeah, I, he's kind of conflating a whole bunch of different disputes with Comics Pro into one post. And that's where... It, if he'd stuck to his main points, it would have been a little bit more like cogent and a little bit more sympathetic. But yeah. instead, it's it seems like a guy who's got an axe to grind. Uh, one of the comments was, as the Wonder World turns. Okay. Yeah. But the one of the points I was going to make about this was, over the seven plus years we've been open, we've had a lot of ideas. Sure. At least three. A lot of our ideas are based off of other ideas yeah or even if we have an idea and we go forward with it we find out somebody had the same idea as well sure i'm sure a lot of people had an idea like this possibly i i, I can't imagine that someone didn't see record store day doing well in their community and thinking why don't we have a version of that but if he put it together and pitched it to the comics pro board and then they kind of did it themselves without him I, it's it's not the coolest thing right but can you say you stole my idea and you fucked it up by changing it is it still his idea i guess i mean if if i had the idea uh to serve every challenger's customer vanilla ice cream and i told you that and then you went forward and said, I had a great idea. We're going to serve every Challenger's customer vanilla ice cream with a little bit of motor oil inside. I'd be like, you stole my idea and you screwed it up. Well, I would say chocolate because chocolate is way better, but you would think I'm ruining it because you don't like chocolate ice cream. No, I, there's a difference between tweaking it and ruining it. Chocolate <laughs> would be see. tweaking it. Motor oil would be ruining it. Uh, uh, for example, so I suggested Rob Schamberger paint the entire Poffo family. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, joke, I mean, as, far as, as far as Dennis Barger's claims, I, I don't care. It's the sort of drama of, I, we might never find out whose idea it was. And even if we did, 
I still don't care. Like, if they stole it from him, it's a shitty move. It's not going to make me, like, quit the organization or form a protest or sign a petition or whatever. I'm just going to be like, I wish they hadn't done that. There's several people that say, I remember talking about this at a Comics Row meeting, you know, four years ago, five years ago, whatever. Right. And admittedly, Dennis is saying he, he pitched it to them. While he had the idea four years ago, he pitched it last year. Sure. And it... I can't imagine we would ever get any sort of confirmation one way or the other. He's going to say it's his idea. They're going to say, no, we had it before you. And since we'll never know and I don't care, then all right. <laughs> Changing gears slightly. Yes. So the Saturday after Thanksgiving is a uh, local comic shop day. Yes. The Wednesday before Thanksgiving, Patrick, do you understand the significance of that day? I do from a store standpoint but not a national standpoint from a national international standpoint probably it it used to be the day that survivor series was on every year it was the wednesday before thanksgiving but it's not anymore this is comic book related the wednesday before thanksgiving we'll see the release of secret wars number eight according to a marvel email today maybe uh secret war seven uh will be coming out the last week of october Okay. Secret Wars 6 will be coming out the last week of September. Or maybe the second to last week of September. I think it's the 23rd, maybe. Yeah, 23rd. And then December, Patrick, what do we see in December? Christmas! Yeah, it's true. And the new Star Wars movie so many times. Uh, but again, let's let's talk comics. Secret Wars number 9. Number, number nine, 9 of eight of an eight-part series. Will be coming out uh, this December, hopefully. So big... They had to give it another issue. Yeah. Also, so there's no way. There's no way those books are coming out those dates because that is a month or a less in between them. And it is increasingly taking six weeks at least to do an issue. Yeah. I mean, keep in mind, issue six is coming out September 23rd. Issue when issue five, five came out, what, mid-August? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's like at least five weeks. Yep. And yeah, I mean that's that's been the problem for a while. Is once they started rescheduling, they're not catching up. They're never going to do it in less than four weeks ever. Can't get faster. Um, and the main tool they would have to get this thing back on track would be replacing the artist or at least adding additional artists to carry the load. And they've already said they're not going to do that. It's going to be Asad Rivik because that was how it was pitched and conceived. I mean, at this point, they can't because if they start doing it now, they should have done it earlier, and the book would be on time. Yeah, it's it's always funny to me that the end of a story at Marvel doesn't matter. Like, that's been the case for so many years now. Is, you know, like, before Axis was over, they were already pitching Secret Wars, you know? Like, we never get to live in the epilogue of any story. So by the time Secret Wars ends, we'll already be two months into all new, all different Marvel. Three by the time it might actually come out. I don't have it in front of me, but I really enjoyed their press release where they spun it as, uh, you know, it's a Marvel series. So while you may not have all of, I'm going to look for it. I'm going to see if I can find it because it was pretty great. And it's, hey, we know that everything else will be a couple issues in by then, but, you know, it's okay. We're sowing the seeds for things that may come to fruition later or, or, you know, may not. Yeah. Or you may know that this happened, but you won't know why it happened until Secret Wars 9. And it's like, I don't know that I'll care anymore. No, but it was really funny just the way they they phrased it. In, sure. In like, no, this is the best for everybody. This is best for business. I don't know if there's a store out there that was really hoping for the Secret Wars hardcover to come out in time for the holiday shopping season. Uh, but that 100% will not be happening. That, nope. That thing won't come out until January. Not going to happen. And... I, that's a $75 hardcover. Like, I, there probably is at least one store that was going to do, like, gangbusters business with that thing. And now that money's just not going to be there. Yeah. And no one will care holiday 2016. Like, that'll be so far in the rear view. Plus, we'll all be reading comics just beamed into our heads digitally, so it's not even a thing where... We'll all be watching Star Wars movies all day, every day. Comics won't even matter anymore. Yep. Even Star Wars comics won't matter anymore. <laughs> Every six months we'll be watching a new Star Wars movie. It'll be great. Um, I did a lot of question answering for a, a sketched piece again, and the actual article came out uh, a few days ago. 
Oh, cool. And I don't have it open in my tabs. What was it about? It was about everything we talked about last week and the week before about <laughs> all of the Marvel ordering for the month. Basically, it was him. Okay. It was it was David Harper saying, "Hey, all the retailers are saying October is a really really tough month to order from. Why is that?" Well, because of ghosts. I mean, that's that's the main scary. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, you open uh, those diamond boxes, and who knows what sort of mummy or werewolf or vampire could jump out at you. I feel like you're just talking about that Jason story. Uh, no, just in general. Like, oh, October is okay. a scary month. Uh, here is questions. I won't read the answers, because you can find it on sketched.com. That's S-K-T-C-H-D. Plus, I imagine we spent the last three weeks talking about it on this podcast. Right. Between the laundry list of number ones, the high ordering thresholds for a considerable list of variants, and the mere fact that this is... In terms of marketing, an entirely new line, it seems Marvel's order for this month were difficult, were as difficult as they've ever been for retailers. For you, what were the biggest difficulties in figuring out what to order and how much you should order of each? And then, for books that are unreturnable but require things like exceeding orders up to 200% to get certain variants, how do you weigh the potential return of said variant versus the downside of being potentially stuck with significant excess inventory? Additionally, when do you order big to get variants? What becomes of those extra copies? Do you just look at them as a sunk cost? As a person whose job is above all to sell comic books, how do you view incentive cover incentive variants like the ones that require immense overorders for this month? In the grand scheme of things, do you look at them as a net positive for comics, or something is that problematic? I'm going to read you the first an- the first line from everybody's answers. Mm-hmm. They're both. They are ridiculous and hurt the industry. I think this is. Uh, I think this type of ordering schemes are dangerous for the industry. Incentive variants are nice to have if we already qualify for them. The overall incentive variants this month are problematic. It goes back to the books. I was hoping you would laugh at least at one of them. Why? Because it was mine and it was funny. I the, said they are ridiculous and hurt the industry. Yeah. No, I knew that was yours. I, okay. That's. I didn't think that was a joke answer. I thought no, that it's, was... it's not a joke answer, but it's no, uh, yeah, it's it's such a real answer that it's not even funny anymore. It's that is the low key version of how I feel about those incentive levels. Um, how do you feel about Invincible Iron Man number one? How are you going to order on it? Is it a big seller? And then lastly, how are you going to order number twos? <laughs> number twos, exactly like number twos. <laughs> There you go. Uh, it's interesting because you, he, he has a, a great cross section of retailers, as you could tell from those first sentences. That mm-hmm. you know, it, it's it's split. I mean, you know, retailers have very diverse opinions on a large number of topics. Yeah, there's stores that love variants, and there's stores that hate variants, and that's gonna cause a lot of different reactions to the way Marvel publishes their books. Yep. Um, there was. Uh, Man, there was something else, but it's not even worth getting into it because I was I was actually if I remembered if this episode would have been able to start out of the gate the correct way, I was going <laughs> to open it with uh, welcome to controversy of challengers week number two and then launch into some dumb comic shop thing. But we kind of already did. There was already disgruntledness and and what have you disgruntledness. That's the thing that happens all the time. Sure. Uh, I did something that. Uh, a friend of mine described as life changing. That friend is Caitlin Drake McKay, who is one of my two go to tattoo artists. Mm-hmm. And I got a new tattoo today, pretty much that sums up my last 25 years and celebrates them at the same time. And there are photos available on the internets in many places. In fact, that post I read before is accompanied by a photo of the new ink. And while I previously had 38 tattoos and yes i i counted recently specifically for gustavo duarte so i knew when uh to get number 32 which he wanted to be number 32 so uh, in fact ashley challenger helped me count during the gustavo duarte signing (laughs) and i've kept a record and even a facebook uh photo gallery with all the individual tattoos listed not necessarily in chronological order because i don't remember but all of them listed but as Caitlin said today, uh, A, this is life-changing. B, this is a tattooer's tattoo. Like, this is a tattoo. The like, other ones weren't? Like a capital T tattoo. And, and honestly, 
up until this point, I I understand her her, her meaning because. Can you explain in, it to me? <laughs> up, in, up until now, no, well, I was about to. Okay. <laughs> up until now, I could still hide them pretty well. You know, long sleeves. You don't know I have tattoos. Sure. But now, I'm making a statement that oh yes, yes I do. They are part of who I am. But more importantly, so are comics. And it's also a tattooer's tattoo because it was a long process of collaboration and it may not look like it, but there was a tremendous amount of stencil, clean off, re-stencil, clean off, positioning, flex. How does it look there? Okay, we're going to reposition it. All right, we have to change the axis that we rotated on. I mean, it was a lot of a lot of math involved in in getting this the way that it's done. Cool. And even though it's uh, it's done in healing, there will be round two of this. And uh, in twenty five years? No, in in, uh, in in like a couple months. Okay. Uh, um, additions for uh, the second version, but also uh, these are going to fade pretty quick because of where they are. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going into detail because it's a already available elsewhere. B, most likely going to be the image that represents this podcast episode on uh, our platforms, uh, on our website and on iTunes and uh, what have you. Should be easy then. Uh, but also because it'll be a fun thing for you to find the next time you're in the store. Surprise! Although tomorrow you won't be able to see it. No, you're probably not for a day or two. Yeah. I feel like I'm uh, keeping it under wraps. On Actually, purpose. I mean, by the time people hear this Podcast. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, you'll see it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the next point. time you come in, good you point. should we'll see it. Yeah, and I will have uh, un- unveiled them. Yeah. Uh, I believe Saturday night is when they will, well, people can see them in person. Sure. I keep alternating between them and it, because while it is a 10-piece tattoo, it's one tattoo. It only counts as one. Mm-hmm. There are, there are 10 elements to it, though. Okay. And I'll stop talking because it's it's bad form to keep describing or not describing a thing that no one can see. Yeah. Hey, audio. <laughs> Hurrah. There's still no camera on this. Dal, how was Space Dumplings? I enjoyed it. It's a, it's a beautiful book. Man, oh, man. Uh, it's gorgeous. Um, it's interesting to read a, a Craig Thompson book that is aimed at younger readers because while he still hits some of the themes that he does in Blankets and Habibi, it's obviously toned down a bit, um, Would but you I like it. Consider uh, goodbye, chunky rice. For, uh, good, I'm sorry. Uh, goodbye, chunky rice. What about it? Is that targeted for people a little bit younger than blankets, or? Yeah, I it. I think teenagers can read blankets and probably should read blankets. Um, Habibi is for a little older. Goodbye, chunky rice. Could be for teenagers, but there's a poignancy to it if you're a little older. That's the thing. It's that drawn in a up. style, and it uses cutesy characters, so it looks like it's targeted younger, but oh, it's no. kind of well, heavy. I mean, there's very little content-wise that is inappropriate for for teens or younger in, in Goodbye Chunky Rice, if memory serves. But it's one of those books where the themes that it's exploring are way more poignant if you are older. Uh, they mean more. You'll you'll be able to connect to things in the story a lot easier and a lot more fully if you're late teens, early twenties, and you read Goodbye Chunky Rice. Gotcha. But yeah, Space Dumplings is a, it's an all ages book. Um, is it the start of a series? Uh, probably. It's fairly complete. But it's not like an amulet that is ends to be continued. No, there's no cliffhanger in this. It, but there's clearly things they could do more of in future stories. Like there's, there's not an ending that creates a situation that you could never go back to those stories or those characters. Like it just ends this story and it's, there's a lot in it. It's a big book. It's a Craig Thompson book. So it is like almost 300 pages. And really it probably could have been two to three books if they'd wanted to split it up, which is nice because I, as much as I enjoyed battling boy, that felt so unfinished. Like it just stopped when he ran out of pages. This feels like a full Craig Thompson when, book. When Paul Pope ran out of pages. Yeah, when Paul Pope was doing Battling Boy. Sorry, I mean, you just said he. I wanted to make sure people right, think I'm, that I'm, it was Craig I, Thompson. I was using those two because Paul Pope and Craig Thompson feel like two guys that are maybe contemporary. I mean, 
Paul Pope was sure. working before Craig Thompson was, but I think of them in kind of the same level of, you know, auteurs. Yeah, no, I get uh, that. But yeah, when when Paul Pope did Battling Boy, as much as I enjoyed the story, it just felt unfinished. And this feels, from Craig Thompson, like a complete book. Uh, I liked it. If you're a Craig Thompson fan, there's no reason not to pick up Space Stump ones. Uh, as Caitlin Challenger said, is this a book for babies? Caitlin Challenger? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. So is it a book for babies? No, it's not a book for babies. It's a book for anyone who likes comics. Yeah, it's an all ages book. And if you have an age, it's for you. The Jason book. I'm just re- I'm asking you about books that you that I asked you about last week that you hadn't read yet. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I read If You Steal, the new Jason um, short story collection. I, I think you read that too, right? I did. In my head, I keep calling it How I Steal. No, it's If You Steal. If You Steal. Uh, uh, oh, not my favorite that... one of his. No, uh, it, it seemed to have more stories in it than most of those hardcover collections do. Um, yeah, pro- yeah, because the stories are not nearly as long. Yeah. Um, there's uh, like I... three or four really good stories in there, and I think the other stories are interesting exercises, but not really compelling stories. I believe we both enjoyed the masked wrestler has to rescue his girlfriend from a dungeon. Yeah, the weird escalating endless fight scene. That was really fun. The one with the chameleon in the desert was really good. Yeah, that was a pretty great, a different, like a, he uses a different, not a different art style for the chameleon, but it's got detail in it, which a lot of his work doesn't have. Yeah, and he uses the the page layouts and the panels in a really fun way. Like where the focus is and where the background is. It's it's clever. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. I like the Frida Kahlo one okay. Yeah. Uh, mostly because it was just weird, and but it was the right kind of weird uh, where I had a good time with it. Um, it probably... you, you read an interview with him or an article about the first story? Yeah, I can't remember where. Um, somebody, I think, had done an interview with him promoting the book ahead of release. And he'd mentioned that uh, he'd wanted the first story... Um, it was a, it's a fairly not a fairly straightforward but a relatively straightforward uh, noir story. Oh, it could have been way more straightforward. But he wanted it to to do some interesting things with pacing, so he basically shuffled up the pages, and what came out was what came out. Um, and he wanted to do something that that evokes something like Memento, where by changing the way scenes are structured, individual units are straightforward, but then how they relate to one another changes based on their placement in the story. And that made for, again, I, I thought it was an interesting exercise, but it wasn't a very compelling story. It was complicated without being fulfilling necessarily. I feel like I would have enjoyed it a little bit better if I got to read it after I read it his way, if I got to read it the proper way through. Yeah, I'll be honest. I mean, from what I was able to glean from it, it didn't seem like what was there. If if you had unshuffled the pages, I don't know that it still would have been a very good story. Yeah. It was okay. Uh, I'm just going to ask if I can tear all the pages out of your story and figure out how they go. Of course. But I'll need two copies because there's no guarantee yep. that the backside of the page will... In, in fact, it almost is guaranteed it will not work without two copies. Ugh. Sorry. <sighs> Fine. Take it up with Jason. I, I will, but I don't speak Norwegian. He speaks English. <laughs> Does he? Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, forgive me. I'm a geographicist. I don't think that's a word. I'm, I don't know. I got, I got nothing. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. And keep reading comics for 25 years. This has been Contest of Challengers. Thanks for listening. Keep reading comics. Challengers is located at 1845 Northwestern Avenue in the Bucktown neighborhood of Chicago, 773-278-0155. You can visit Challengers on the web at challengerscomics.com. You can direct email to challengers at challengerscomics.com. You can become a fan on Facebook at facebook.com slash challengerscomics. And you can follow Challengers on Twitter at twitter.com slash challengers. I was trying to make a new word that had me judging people just based off of where they come from. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. That's that, that's conservative. Sorry, I, I I didn't have that. Yeah, no, it's that's we already have a word for that. Yeah. Okay. My bad. I didn't I didn't fix that properly.
obviously this is the point in the uh, recording where obviously <laughs> we just talk to make sure we don't lose anything yes when it, it's cut off all of this is garbage garbage talk from garbage people cool. well there's the title for the episode <laughs> Now, just to be clear, you said from garbage people, not for garbage people, right? Yeah, this is garbage talk from garbage people. (laughs) That should be our new podcast. (laughs) Controversy of Challengers, garbage talk from garbage people. Uh Oh, man. And it's just going to be like Oscar the Grouch. Let's not oversell it, you know? Yeah, right. Uh, Set your expectations to the lowest you have. Set your expectations to stunned. See, I was (laughs) just stunned. Nice. And that's a little nod to JVO's old podcast, Stun. Sure, okay. <laughs> I would totally drop in the audio for Stun, mm. except that I don't have it. Oh, I'm sorry. And I, I don't know how to uh, to get it, per se. Per se. See any good movies? No, I was working on stuff all day, so I didn't really even watch. Yeah, the... Diary of a Teenage Girl. It's comic related. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that was should really have talked good, about that. It? Yeah. Uh, I watched the last episode of Another Period today. And yeah, it was um, mostly funny, but then they wrapped up a ton of stuff. And I was just like, why are you wrapping up a ton of stuff? This You is... have a second season. Yeah, well, I'm sure they didn't know that. But even if they oh. didn't know that, it's still a clunky last few minutes. Huh. Um, but it was still funny. Well, that's good. It's a good show. Yeah, I, meant, I, I didn't even realize until I was... Like, right before we recorded, I realized, oh, I never watched Ballers from this week, which I think is the finale. Okay. Um, so I got to do that, and then I got to do the next two hours of Show Me a Hero. Do they do it in two-hour blocks? Yeah, they do two hours a week for three oh, weeks. I hate that. It's, I mean, it's fine. You can just watch an hour and stop. Is, is it two episodes they just put back yeah. to back? Okay, then I can do that. It's like, part, this week is parts three and four. Gotcha. Okay. That's easier to, to, to navigate. Yeah, um, my recording had screwed up for the first two parts, so I had to watch them on demand. On demand, you can just watch part one and then part two. Like, they're two separate uh, file listings. Yeah, but you can't fast forward. Yeah, you can. It's HBO. Oh. Yeah, I mean, the only stuff where you can't fast forward is if it's got ads in it. Network TV, yeah. Yeah, so HBO stuff, you can fast forward, you can rewind. Well, there's no reason to fast forward, because you don't have to. Right, there's nothing to fast forward through. (laughs) Yeah, never mind. All right. Well, hopefully that's good enough. Hopefully. Good, good, good enough. So I'm going to hang up and we're going to find out. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. You connected? Yes. I, I can't hear you at all. Uh, I don't know why. Um, hold on. It's this new it's this new microphone. It's... I got a red light let on. Let me see if I have to keep... Can you talk for me? Yeah. Um... All right, hold on. What is... This is me talking. <clears throat> okay so give me a minute to hook up a different microphone because this new microphone not working i can hear you well this is annoying i tried the new microphone and then another new microphone and neither worked so i'm back to the old shitty desk one but i could hear you before yeah but i couldn't hear you I could see your level moving, uh-huh. but I couldn't hear you. I knew you were talking, but I couldn't hear you. Something about the, whatever this one is called, the one that, mm. that I was, the Samson whatever, Samson whatever, it also tries to take over the speakers, huh. but it's a microphone. So as when I plugged it in, all my sounds stopped working, like the oh, iTunes weird. stopped and YouTube stopped weird so then i just i pulled it out and went right for the snowball mic uh but that for some reason didn't show up in the microphone status of the of my sound peculiar yeah 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 and now you're super loud so i want to bring you down just a little bit Sorry. i'm gonna bring you down think of dead puppies did that work yeah okay good you're down on the plus side, it does show me recording, so that's a good sign. Right. Um, or at least me being... Yeah, no, recording. But now I have so many cables, <laughs> things, all over my desk. It's annoying. I know what that's like. I'm sure. You don't have a desk. No, but I had a lot of cables out on the floor earlier tonight. And some Deadpools, too, while we're at it. 